game devs. In this video, we're going to talk about a studio structure, how generally the studio is, is designed internally and how it's managed, what you might expect when you go into a studio. Everywhere is going to be a little bit different, uh, but you'll generally see uh, certain patterns um, because companies are, and you know, software is made by um, uh, there's uh, best practices uh, generally, you'll you'll only encounter a couple kinds of of structures uh, because that's what works in the game industry. So the first thing is, uh, you know, d there's a usually a design department. Um, there's a couple departments that you'll you'll find a design lead uh, will be le uh, a design lead will be responsible for uh, level design, system scripting. Uh, this is also where narrative development usually slots in as well. So if there's writing on the team, uh, that might be even just a contractor that comes in for a short while. Uh, that all goes and is uh, that all goes under the design department's uh, purview. Uh, there's also an art uh, department, um, which is usually headed up by someone. Uh, there's uh, animation, visual effects, modeling. Everything under the sun uh, is in the art department, and it tends to be bigger uh, than others. Uh, we also see the programming department. Um, that's generally gameplay tools and networking. Uh, there's someone who's leading up that department as well. Someone has to manage all those people and do hiring and firing, all that kind of stuff. Uh, as we discussed in the uh, as we discussed in the interviewing uh, process, sometimes all of the team is involved in hiring and firing at some level, but um, usually there is someone who has to in uh, who has to instigate it because also that's a financial decision so people who are making financial decisions generally uh don't uh, move, uh spread their power out too much um and uh, there's also the production and business side so um, there's a lead producer and then there's usually for you know and this is kind of like a, a, a military thing um, most of the time um a i think a squad is like eight people one sergeant seven soldiers um and uh we we've found that socially it's really hard to manage more than about seven people uh, a, a really good rule of thumb is not to overextend your producers uh so you'll often see assistant um or associate producers the difference is some companies will use one as the lowest rung some companies use the other yeah so your mileage may vary and you know there's the qa and hr and sound those all kind of just float around usually and are tapped uh when needed um, and, you know, it depends on how big your studio is, so you may not have any of those people. It might just be the uh, developers. Um, so there's a, a studio that I'm going to call Structured Studio. Uh, a Structured Studio is one that's going to have all of these departments. They're also going to have probably a CEO, COO, all those kind of things. Uh, and their responsibility is to go get client work. Their job is to go get money. Uh, to go get projects and to bring it back into the studio. So uh, when we have that happening, we have all of the departments kind of running together, working on stuff. Uh, the CEO is come, is uh, handling day to day as well, um, but uh, uh, trying to get those projects in. So in a structured studio, uh, we're going to have a lot of, uh, you know, we're going to have at least one team here. Uh, this may, of course, be more teams, multiple teams, uh, you know, and that might become a design department with multiple design leads but this is kind of just a one project view um so you know multi uh, they might have multiple projects running so this is uh similar to the way um uh, i've worked at, at studios before uh, but it's also uh, very similar to the way that uh, zynga likes to work uh, from the, unless they've changed their policies, the way Zynga works is actually that every stu uh, every game or every project is actually its own kind of studio with its own lead producer programming uh, and all that kind of thing. Um, but uh, they all work uh, around the same, uh, you know, they all use the same HR people and they have the same CEO. Um, but you actually have to apply from one studio, uh, from one project to another if there's a job opening. So your job is only as secure as your next project uh, and not um, as the, you know, not as a, a, an employee at that studio, which I, I think is a really interesting approach. I don't know if it's good or bad, uh, you know, if there's any 
Zynga uh, uh, developers out there, you can maybe chime in. But um, uh, yeah, you know, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I'm sure it has its pluses or minuses. So then we also go to a pooled studio. Uh, a pooled studio is a term that you know I'm coining here, um, and in in which we have a couple teams typically, which have a small amount of design. Um, we have an art lead, and then we have a programming uh, uh, team as well. The group that we take out of this is all of the art. And what we do is we put all of the uh, developers inside of a pool, and then we allocate resources to whichever team needs it most, um, and has you know has all of their stuff together at the right time. So um, you know I've seen a studio also move to this approach in which they kind of only have a very small uh, team, and then they kind of go to the modeling pool, and then if the modeling pool gets overwhelmed, they can go out to art, art outsourcing, or if maybe that's just part of your process is to do some of the art from outsource so kind of depends on what you're doing um but uh and you know a pooled stu uh, studio this is what hr is you know most companies don't have like uh multiple departments of hr they just have one so sometimes it's just uh, a department that everyone needs and goes to um so you know uh there there has been some success with that as well so i get asked this a lot um, uh, because it's kind of confusing and the terms are not always the same. What I'd like to illuminate for you is uh, how ranking works. So, you know, we have the intern, which is the, the first rung on the bar. Uh, we also then see t uh, jobs that say entry level or junior. Um, then we have a, a rank, which is mid-level. Mid-level is usually just called designer, programmer, engineer. And you can tell, you know, is uh, maybe there's three to five years experience or something like that. A shipped title, two shipped titles. Uh, you see a lot of mid-level jobs out there. Um, and then we have um, the, the split. So in most studios, if they're doing it right, um, can, they can recognize that some developers don't want to do management stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would say that it would be to the company's folly to it, promote people into management who don't want to do it. Um, uh, so there tend to be two types of scene. There's a senior developer, senior developers, uh, at least, uh, you know, they may be called something different uh, where you end up, but I call them senior developers. They are d generally people who execute um, uh, very well, uh, whatever the task they need to do. Um, and they are maybe not interested in leadership other than maybe a, le a learning mentorship kind of thing. But um, they're not interested in like the, uh, the, big, the big decision stuff. Um, you know, and then we also see leads, which are people who have risen to a level of management and decision making. And then you have usually a boss, which is a director. Speaking of bosses, though, um, there are, you know, you are right there in the middle. Um, yeah, let me get my pointer out. So you're right here. And uh, your bosses are your direct reports. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but um, your department head, um, so your design, you know, for me, it was uh, my design department uh, head. Uh, um, you know, that was Tim Stelmach for a time, um, uh, design lead, uh, you know, a design lead on a project. So that is someone who's working on an individual project. They probably, their boss is also the department head, probably. Um, and then we also have a producer. Uh, a producer is also someone you might be reporting to. They're the one who's paying the bills and or helping guide you and uh, giving you the tasks that you need to do because they've already uh, decided as a team what it is that needs to happen. Um, and then, you know, there's the CEO and the client. Um, so, you know, we've also, I, I put direct reports in here and I think it's really important to understand that uh, even though you might be in a hierarchy that uh, puts you at the bottom. I think you should really think about business and going forward, successful businesses like the, you know, um, the game developers conference, the volunteers, um, uh, they, they generally have a really uh, important and valuable uh, uh, lesson to learn, which is you, it, your job is to support um, the customer uh, to, you know, deliver an excellent game. Um, but uh, if you have direct reports, your job is to support the direct reports in making amazing game. Your bosses should be there to support you 
in doing your job, not there to stop you from doing your job or to do it less well than you possibly could. And, and that goes for everyone, um, you know, all the way down to the CEO, you know, and that goes all the way down to the CEO. Uh, the CEO is there to enable the art heads to do their job. The way the CEO does that is by bringing in business so that they can do a job. Um, but the CEO isn't there to design a game. Uh, you know, at least generally that's, that's the way it should go. A lot of times people have their, their own opinions. Um, and you know, they're not, cause like the CEO is not going to be jumping in there to program the game either. Um, oh, you know, maybe they, maybe they are, you know, um, but, uh, in general, uh, that's not really their role. Um, so thinking about that going forward, I think that that would help you and, uh, help serve you to make sure that you can understand that you're a servant leader. Uh, you're someone who is supporting other people in order to help people, uh, make a really amazing product. Uh, and then also, you know, there might be multiple teams in a studio uh, as well. Uh, they're also supporting the customer and they also report out. Uh, so there's a there's an exception here. There's the valve. Uh, this is a, a chart from valves, uh, valves handbook. And we'll take this as a uh, and we'll take look through this in a, in a second uh, in more detail. Um, but uh, as you can see here, this is Gabe right here, this little dot. And this is everyone. Everyone. Chet, uh, they they also have a couple different diagrams of clusters of people or just whatever. Uh, and this says, I'm the noob, coffee anyone, hello, um, from this one one character. Uh, so let's go take a look at Valve's employee handbook. Uh, so uh, there'll be a link down below. Uh, but uh, the Valve handbook goes over some really important uh, uh, aspects of how their company works and specifically the chart that i was showing you was explaining that they have a flat structure so there's not a lot of people who have flat structures uh companies uh because they're incredibly hard to do um and so this handbook was released it was released publicly um uh to talk about how they judge people how they bring people in um so how it owns its intellectual property um, but the fact uh, is that they have no structure in their company. They may have people who they hire in who do the, do certain roles. Um, but, uh, there is an opportunity to pick your own projects and there's an opportunity to decide based on you, everyone around you talking about what it is you should do. And, you know, I think that this is often, you know, here's a, here's our section about, uh, team leads and structure. Um, there, the, this does happen, uh, is, is the, is the response they have. Like a team itself has to have some sort of, uh, leadership group, uh, some sort of, uh, ability to make decisions. At least, you know, something needs to happen. It may not be exactly all, um, democratic, but, uh, once the game, once a project starts going, but there needs to be some cabal process. And that's what Valve has um, uh, going for it. Uh, they specifically design their entire studio based around it. They have movable desks that roll around. Uh, uh, so one of the things that uh, Valve does in order to do this uh, really hard thing is they hire T-shaped people, uh, which is what they call it. Uh, T-shaped people are someone who is very good in one aspect, in this case, heavy weaponry. Um, but they also have broad, uh, applicable skills in every area so that they understand most other things. They also only hire better than them. So there are other structures out there, but I would say Valve and you can see their success. I mean, over the years, right? They are a, one of the most incredibly wealthiest companies in the world. Um, uh, they have had a lot of success specifically with steam. Um, so, you know, valve, uh, works on without structure, um, and they basically form committees. Uh, they, you know, they have formal, uh, uh, you know, they don't have as much, 
uh, formal structure and, um, you know, they work really hard as well. Uh, and, you know, that actually reflects something I, uh, the way that academia in research works, not all academics works like this, it's just the research um, uh, departments, uh, much like UConn. Uh, but uh, academics and research uh, work a lot of the same ways. You will come in as a research faculty um, who might be in charge of just their own goals. Um, they might collaborate with other researchers. Um, those are when they sign you know, a grant together because there might be some applicable thing there. Um, so, you know, like I work a lot with um, I work a lot with STEM and STEAM uh, educational projects. I also work with the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, but like those kind of projects aren't something that I personally am the only uh, I, I'm not the subject at matter expert on everything. Um, and so what my my subject expertise is in is game development. Um, but uh, we also have a uh, uh, we also have other faculty that are, um, you know, working in the humanities. So National Endowment for Humanities, um, uh, we're working together to create uh, projects that they'll be interesting and valuable to both our careers. Um, and we typically write, uh, you know, the one thing we do, though, that's a little different from Val for sure, is we write a research statement and we state our interest when we apply. So um, uh, there, there is a, a much bigger emphasis on like being listed uh, on a on a grant or a published paper. Valve doesn't really do that. In fact, Valve doesn't do credits uh, the same way. Uh, they don't follow IGDA standards, at least they didn't the last time I looked. Uh, they instead list everyone's name and that's it um, so I I don't know I kind of like that as well it's part of their no titles thing um, um, there's also uh, a difference because because uh, at least here at UConn you know academics have unions and the ability to protect their research uh, and ability to allow them to do their own research is actually protected you know uh, by the union uh, the AAUP um, so if you know uh, that's called academic freedom uh, so, you know, th it is a little bit different for sure than Valve, but there's a lot of similarities there. And uh, we, you know, I think we could really learn a lot from each other in terms of how to make really interesting projects. But that's, you know, I think part of the magic of making cutting edge research uh, or cutting edge projects in general. Um, so if so, that's it. I will see you in class. Yeah.